Good evening, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Thank you for joining me this evening. I'm not live, uh, to be clear. We are recording this, but please do leave thoughts, comments, questions, etc. on the topics I'm going to cover this evening. And I'm going to do a book review this evening. I'm going to look at two books. The Fake News Factory by David Sedgwick and Stealth War by Robert Spaulding. These two are, as I say, uh, timely books and content quite shocking. Uh, and I've gone through the books and I've taken out what I think are some of its most hard-hitting points. And I'll read a little bit from the books and do, as I say, get involved. Let me know your thoughts, uh, comments, questions, etc. OK, so let's start with this one. This is the Fake News Factory. And as you can see by the little illustration here, we're talking about a particular fake news factory. It is, of course, our very own BBC. Now, David Sedgwick, this is not his only book about the uh, BBC. It's the only one I've read, uh, but it is filled with examples and information about the shocking bias of the BBC. Uh, and if you, even if you think you, you know the BBC well, uh, you may still be surprised about some of what's in here now it started the bbc bias because let's let's remember we're talking about an organization which was one of the most respected in the world it has transformed absolutely transformed it's no longer one of the most respected in the world but it is certainly one of the most distrusted and the numbers of people here in the uk who are increasingly say that they don't trust the BBC. It's quite a revolutionary thing because the BBC has been at the heart and, and, and the forefront of, of British culture for a very, very long time. And to see now growing numbers of people cancelling their television licence, uh, and I, I, I suspect or I strongly believe that if it weren't compulsory, if the BBC were defunded, and it should be and it must be, and events of recent weeks have convinced, I think, more and more people that it must be defunded. Uh, if that's the case and people are required to pay for it privately, I suspect it won't survive. And it certainly won't survive. It certainly won't continue to live in the manner to which it has become accustomed at, under the uh, public purse. But according to David Sedgwick, the rot started to set in around the... 70s, 80s, uh, and it's ramped up under Thatcher's government. Um, and they are fervently, and you'll know this already, fervently uh, anti-conservative. And their bias is there for all the world to see. So we will, uh, just to, to let you know, just a couple of chapters in here, um, some very interesting chapters, which I've picked to read from. I won't read the entire chapter. So there are chapters on the BBC war on conservatism, the BBC and Brexit, the BBC's shameful silence. I'll read a little bit from that one. False flags and fakery in Syria. Congratulations and jubilations. The uh, persecution of Cliff Richard. Fake news plans for Hungary. Their absolute uh, sp horrific smear campaign against Viktor Orban in uh, in Hungary. Also, they, uh, of course, do the, the whole hate thing. Uh, and their war on Donald Trump. So all of this is, is covered in here. It's a 2020 book, so it's 2020 information in there. So it's really very, very up to date. But I want to go to, I want to start from, and I'll do a little bit of reading from this chapter. I'm not going to read it all, but I do want to tell you some of the bits in what I won't be reading. Uh, and and it's, uh, it's very, very long. Um, so I'll just point out some of it. And it was that back in the 80s, when in their political activism, uh, and just <laughs> as an aside, uh, throughout the book, Sedgwick refers to BBC journalists as activists. And he refers to British Broadcasting Corporation always throughout the entire book with quote marks around the British, which I think is quite clever. So what he tells us in this chapter is that back then, the 70s and 80s, even then, they were calling conservative MPs fascists and racists. 
And if you didn't go along with an extreme left ideal, you were a fascist and or a racist or both. So they've been doing that for a long, long time. Um, and, I, you know, I never thought I myself would be one of the people that the BBC has uh, declared a racist and a fascist. Uh, but there you go. So just a little bit of a uh, little bit of background. Uh, do read the book in full. But just so we don't so we don't make the video way too long, and I do want to cover uh, another book as well, I'll just read small small parts of it. But this is a, a good few paragraphs which may explain a bit of the background. So Britain is a conservative country that occasionally votes Labour. That is the title of John Ramsden's 1997 Swinton lecture chronicling Tory election success in post-war Britain, and it aptly summarises the UK's political landscape. I, I think I probably agree with that. Uh, let me know what you think of that. Britain is a conservative country that occasionally votes Labour. Interesting. So despite the blip that was New Labour, following the Conservative Party's fourth consecutive general election success in 2019, Professor Ramsden's observations have been largely borne out. Traditional and Tradition and stability appear to be valued among large swathes of the British population, absolutely. Much to BBC irritation, the nuclear family remains the ideal domestic unit for a significant number of people. Social conservatism continues to define Britain. It might boil the blood of those frighteningly politicised activists who call, who call Broadcasting House home, but it is a fact of life nonetheless. No matter, because the momentum fueling the BBC has no time for those Brits, i.e. the majority, caught up in the crosshairs of its radical express. Jump aboard or be damned, the choice is yours. What had started a decade earlier as a radical US student movement soon crossed the Atlantic, where it quickly gained traction amid a 1970s UK, a domestic landscape of industrial action and unrest. An era of protest had arrived, which has defined the BBC ever since. Attacking ideological enemies became the norm. Although a pillar of the establishment whose health and well-being uh, was intrinsically linked to that of power and privilege, the broadcaster increasingly began to view itself as the voice of social reform. It is a role erroneously assumed within left-wing circles to necessitate confrontation with an implacable enemy, the political right. Now, that's a very astute uh, observation. Indeed, the left wing does need an implacable enemy. Uh, and the left wing doesn't just disagree with its political opponents. It despises them. It will happily ruin lives. And I've got to say, just on this point, and, and this is completely off on a tangent, but I've got to say, and I've got to say this, well done to the chap with the airplane but I know I've, 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 he has been sacked from his job and so has his girlfriend, I believe. And this happened to a footballer recently as well, an American so soccer player, as they call it in America, who plays for LA. His wife tweeted disapproval for Black Lives Matter and he uh, was, uh, his career was irreparably damaged because this is incredible, but this is what they do, destroy lives. It's not enough to win a legitimate fair election at the ballot box. In fact, they're terrified of a battle at the ballot box because they can't win it because they have no politics that is workable or fair or sane. So they destroy lives too and they do it. Uh, in fact, I won't say they do it in conjunction with the BBC. The BBC is among them. They are the BBC. So the book goes on. Indeed, the mere mention of conservative has always been enough to bring a scowl to the faces of BBC activists through the years. A term in uh, conservative, the term conservative, invariably used by the broadcaster, according to Sir Norman Tebbett, as a portmanteau word of abuse. Even today, seven years after her death and three decades after her political career ended, special bile is reserved in BBC land for one female Tory in particular. The election of Mrs Thatcher as Prime Minister in 1979 
signalled the start of what could only ever be a collision course between the staunchly conservative grocer's daughter and a public broadcaster, the hijacking of which by a new breed of liberal left self-styled social justice warriors had all but been completed by the start of the 80s. Journalistically, staff were quite mystified by the early years of Thatcher, confessed former BBC Director General Mark Thompson. The BBC prefers its Tories to be apologetic, submissive. It could never quite get its head around Margaret Hilda Thatcher. Well, they must be doing, they must be enjoying themselves with Boris Johnson then, if they like their Tories submissive. Uh, And I don't mean to, um, you know, that's not a, a, a gratuitous insult or attack at Boris Johnson. I am simply appalled by the failures of this government to, uh, number one, to apply this lockdown stuff consistently across the board, uh, and number two, to allow people to keep coming in across the English Channel, and they are allowing them to do so. And number three, perhaps most shameful of all, is the fact that Winston Churchill is standing in Parliament Square, covered in a great big metal box, and Boris Johnson is allowing that. He's allowing that. The BBC, for its, uh, its, its contribution to this debate, is to describe Winston Churchill as a controversial figure. They really are the lowest of the low. OK, I'm going to go on to another chapter now, which is chapter five. And this one is entitled Grooming Gangs, the BBC's Shameful Silence. And as you can probably guess, my attention was drawn to this one quite quickly. So I've gone through the book again uh, today and picked out what I think you might uh, might be uh, interesting to read to you. It's quite, it's a few pages and I tried my best to uh, sort of bring it, to, to bring down a little bit what, uh, how much of it to read, uh, but it was particularly difficult actually because so much of it, so much of it is so important. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, I, I want to read, okay, listen, I'll tell you what I'll do. Um, okay. I know where I'm going to stop. I know where I'm going to stop. I could read the whole chapter. I really could. But it will make the video too long. So please do go and read it yourself. This is mind-blowing, this part. And this is the reason. This is the longest bit I'm going to read out. But bear with me. Um, Like I say, mind-blowing. Okay, let's start. If there is one topic guaranteed to grab the attention of the British Broadcasting Corporation... It is cases of sexual abuse and or impropriety. At such times, BBC interest is guaranteed. So too is its indignation and condemnation. Perpetrators can expect comprehensive coverage of their misdemeanours splashed across the entire BBC media platform. But there's a snag. Guilty parties must fit the broadcaster's wrong think profile. For example... When footballer Ched Evans was accused of raping a 19-year-old woman back in 2011, the BBC went into overdrive. Radio, television, website, social media, there was no escaping the story of how the former Manchester City player had allegedly had non-consensual sex with a drunken fan in a North Wales hotel room. BBC coverage verged on overkill. Though the footballer denied the accusation, the broadcaster's tone was always disbelieving, manifest as ever in its choice of headlines. Chad Evans, or Chad Evans' rape trial, footballer could have any girl. That was its headline. The BBC went out of its way to portray Evans as an arrogant braggart. Its obsessive coverage prompted some viewers to accuse the organisation of carrying out a moral crusade against the player. Accusations which, in true BBC style, Richard Burgess, head of BBC Sport News, dismissed out of hand. For in BBC land, the narrative is simple. Rich white men accused of rape are always guilty. The victims always innocent. Period. A straight, white, successful male, Evans fitted the BBC perpetrator profile to a T. 
Indeed, when it comes to tales of sexual impropriety, Britain's national broadcaster can certainly be counted on to champion the cause of female victims, alleged or otherwise, while simultaneously taking the male offender to task, guilty or not. Whether it's Donald Trump advising a friend to grab him by the pussy, I have to object to that. Actually, he didn't advise a friend. Just to just, just say. Uh, or Hollywood mogul Hervey Weinstein taking advantage of young actresses. Women everywhere have a powerful advocate in the BBC, which can be relied upon to give round-the-clock coverage with regards to the reprehensible words of Trump or the actions of Harvey Weinstein. Calling for greater empathy towards those who have sec suffered sexual abuse, the broadcaster also readily promoted the hashtag MeToo movement across its platform. In the BBC, victims of sexual abuse have a true friend, one that believes and believes unconditionally. It should therefore have surprised nobody when Newsnight featured a story of alleged sexual impropriety in January 2018 attended by movers and shakers from the worlds of business, media and politics until forced to close its doors following rafts of lurid mainstream media coverage. The President's Club Ball was a black tie charity event which had taken place annually at a top London hotel and where hostesses would perform a range, a range of hospitality duties. In its 30 years of existence, the charity had raised over £18 million for good causes. Following its January 18th event, the Financial Times ran an undercover expose about alleged lewd behaviour of a small minority of guests towards hostesses. Naturally, the ever-gallant BBC seized upon the story. The President's Club event was the top story on the January 24th edition of Newsnight. Well-paid women wearing hostess outfits for the appreciation of rich men. Re re presenter Emily Maitlis huffed and puffed and said, Men! <laughs> What follows was a forensic investigation of the charity's financial statement, statement status and donations. Shock, horror, the BBC was doing investigative journalism, where it was that good old BBC in curiosity reserved for right thinkers. The President's Club event was the top story again on the January 25th edition of Newsnight, so two nights in a row. The news stories that are, this is a quote, the news stories uh, that are emerging from of President's Club dinners at the Dorchester announced a sombre Maitlis are getting harder to hear, not easier with time. Maitlis does love to express her own views, doesn't she? Uh, during an interview with a witness, Anna, the BBC activist, nodded sympathetically as the hostess, hostess told how she had been expected to interact with guests and sign a non-disclosure agreement. The story even made it onto that week's edition of Question Time, featuring on BBC flagship news and current affair programmes leading them. It's fair to say BBC coverage of the President's Club Ball was wide-ranging and wholly condemnation, condemnatory. Not for a single moment did the factory appear to doubt the word of Anna. Her testimony, her testimony was treated with the utmost gravity. Judged by its incessant coverage of Chad Evans, Harvey Weinstein, its constant hyping of the Trump pussy comment and its extensive coverage of the allegations down at the President's Club Ball, Auntie clearly takes the subject of sexual abuse and impropriety very seriously indeed. So, when a horrific story of the industrial scale rape of thousands of girls, some of them as young as 11 years old, broke in March 2018, centering on the West Midlands town of Telford, BBC coverage and outrage must have been a sight to behold, right? Given how much it cares about sexual assault and sexual abuse. From its 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock news bulletins, Radio 4's Today programme and PM programmes, Newsnight and Panorama, the story of the rape, torture and even murder of hundreds, possibly thousands of vulnerable underage girls must have been the only story of interest to Britain's impartial, free and fair national broadcaster for days, weeks, even months. Right? If you assumed this horrific story might spark an unprecedented response by the broadcaster, you'd be wrong. Quite wrong. While some tales of sexual misdemeanours interest the fake news factory to the point of obsession, 
others appear not to bother it too much at all. It rather depends. And this is the case with the police and the government as well. How well put, it rather depends on who is carrying out the abuse. Evans, Weinstein, Trump and President's Club guests had one defining trait in common. Straight white male. The right profile in BBC land in stark contrast. Tales of rape and even murder in the West Midlands of underage, predominantly white girls brought about a rather different BBC response. Indifference, indifference tinged with an unmistakable and highly disturbing streak of cynicism. Appearing on the front page of the Sunday Mirror edition of 11th March 2018, the, the newspaper's headline this Sunday morning told of unspeakable horrors. Britain's worst ever child grooming scandal exposed, wrote the Mirror. Hundreds of girls raped, beaten, sold for sex and even killed. The rape, torture and murder of young girls in the town of Telford spanning 40 years. Here was a story that, un that warranted serious attention. A, a tale of sheer inhumanity unfolding. The Mirror's 18-month investigation had uncovered a shocking level of abuse. Up to a thousand girls, some as young as 11, had been targeted by grooming gangs in the town as authorities unbelievably turned a blind eye. The death of a mother and four girls had been linked to a phenomenon which had begun in the 1980s and described by the paper as vulnerable Telford girls targeted by groups of mainly Asian men. According to witnesses, the abuse was still going on. Telford MP Lucy Allen called the paper's findings extremely serious and shocking. She's a Labour MP. Nothing at all was done about it. Curiously, Britain's perpetually outraged national broadcaster did not seem particularly interested. A potentially huge sexual abuse scandal had just broken, yet not a single word was to be found on the entire BBC platform. Was this really the same organisation that had bombarded the public with stories about Ched Evans' alleged sexual misdemeanours? The same one that professed such indignation at the goings-on at the President's Club Ball just a couple of months earlier? Monday, March 12th, people waited. This is a day later. They checked the BBC television news. Nothing. They checked the BBC radio news. Nothing. They checked the BBC News website. Nothing. For reasons best known to itself, the fake news factory had thus far decided to completely ignore a story that might turn out to be the worst ever case of systemic child abuse in UK history. Writing in The Spectator, Douglas Murray echoed the thoughts of many in an article entitled The BBC's Shameful Silence on the Telford sex scandal. Lunch came and went. Not only is the Telford story not on the BBC news front page, noticed Ed West, remember this is lunch the following day, it is not mentioned, and this part is particularly shocking, it is not mentioned in the England news page, not even on the Shropshire page. Bizarre. You know, BBC Shropshire, Telford is in, is in the county of Shropshire. The day after, the Mirror had revealed what it called the worst ever a sexual abuse scandal in Britain. The day after, even BBC Shropshire, the county in which it took place, it had been going on for 40 years, even BBC Shropshire didn't cover it and were into after lunch the following day and still not a word. Nick Ferrari also wondered what had happened to BBC coverage. Later that Monday afternoon, and with pressure building so other people in the public eye were beginning to condemn the BBC, at Twitter, Facebook, etc., were beginning to wonder, where, why isn't the BBC talking about this? This is crazy. So the book goes on. Uh, later that Monday afternoon, and with pressure building, a report finally popped up, popped up on the corporation's Shropshire page, noting that the latest allegations were not new. A claim that seemed at odds with the very first sentence of the broadcaster's own argument article, which read, calls are being made for a new inquiry into child sexual exploitation in a town further uh, 
further into a town following further allegations. Now, this is not new. That's, that was the BBC's response. It is quite unbelievable. It truly is. The dismissal of the horrific rape and abuse of young girls, the dismissal of it by the BBC when it was forced to talk about it, it's, it's, it only appeared on BBC Shropshire, by the way. It didn't appear on any national BBC platform. Only on BBC Shropshire. And even then, it was dismissive. Oh, this is, this is not new. What, why, why is this in the news? This has been going on for years. Well, surely that's the point. Surely that's the point. Anyway, Cedric continues, for a broadcaster likes nothing more than to recycle President Trump's grab the pussy comment made over a decade before he attained office. BBC cries, BBC cries of not new rang especially hollow. Uh, caught on the back foot, it was almost as if the fake news specialists had not ta thought this one through. And anyway, in the light of the Sunday Mirror revelations, why not give renewed coverage? What harm could there possibly be in shining yet more light on such heinous crimes, giving the victim give victims more assistance and thereby encouraging others to speak up? Suddenly and inexplicably, hashtag Me Too didn't matter so much. Absolutely scandalous. Absolutely scandalous. And that should give you that this is it's just more evidence of things that we already knew, which is that the BBC, as well as the rest of the state apparatus, the police, the government, it's not about, you know, I hear all the time. Uh, well, we used to people used to make the argument about FGM. That if FGM were happening to white girls, uh, the, it would the, the crime would be prosecuted. And I have to say, I mean, there probably was a time that I thought that as well. But it's simply not true, because we can see that what happens to white girls, uh, and nobody cares. You know, the, BB the BBC doesn't care. The only people who care um, are the working class patriotic majority. Um, this is, it's, 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 I, 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 sorry, I, I shouldn't have made that a class issue. Let me just say the, the, the hardworking taxpaying um majority in this country are the only ones who care about this the establishment does not care about these girls at all uh and it doesn't care about them because as cedric rightly identifies because of who the who the perpetrator is it's not about the victim it's about the perpetrator so they don't care about white girls any more than they do black girls subject to fgm it's all about who is doing it so if muslims are doing it then it is ignored. It's all about the perpetrator and not about the victim. And they must maintain this narrative of the cultural Marxism. Uh, certain people always guilty, certain people always innocent. If you're black, if, you, if you're non-white, you are innocent in the eyes of the BBC. Um, that is how it works. And it repeats itself across the entire British establishment. OK, we are we're half an hour now. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through the third part of this that I uh, kept or that I marked off to read to you. But what I'm not so that this video so that this video isn't really, really, really long. Um, what I'm going to do is make a separate one for this. So I will do this uh, at some point. It will be released over the next couple of days. But I do want to take you through this. I thought I'd get through two books at a time, but really I'd like to give them a bit more attention than, uh, than uh, 45 minutes or so uh, allows me to do. So I'm not, it's not going to be next week. I'll do it uh, in the next couple of days and, and put it up um, and let you know. So just, uh, um, just, to, just so we don't uh, make this too long. And the longer a video is, the less likely people are to watch it. So that's the reason for that. Okay, I'm going to skip forward now to chapter chapter 10. And this is the campaign, and it was a campaign. It can be legitimately described as a campaign. A campaign against Donald Trump. Nobody uh, is, is quite as hated by the disgusting BBC as the US president and I recall 
I recall the morning I got up after Trump had been elected and I knew he had been elected just by looking at the demeanour and the facial expressions of the BBC journalists I knew. I said, oh dear, they're looking very depressed. Trump must have won. And that is how I knew he had won. Um, the BBC holds absolute contempt for Donald Trump in its dark little heart. And there, there's, there's a rage there with the BBC over this. And I, you know, I uh, long believed that snobbery is dominates this. This dismissal of myself, uh, people like Tommy Robinson, uh, working class people who speak about things. Of course, we should shut up and know our place. There's nothing snobs dislike more than working class people with a brain who express themselves articulately, who are uh, intelligent and unafraid and will not be intimidated by people who think they're smarter than we are, but they're not. Uh, I'm not intimidated by these people. I'm not intimidated by this class thing. Uh, I know that what I say uh, is researched and read, and I know that I'm a thinking person. But there is little that and uh, that angers the established BBC types. Uh, little angers them more than the working class having a say. And they uh, this this is why they hate Trump so much because he was largely elected by the working the by the American working class who had been abandoned. With, with you know, globalism had sent all their jobs to China, uh, they, we, we we saw you could see almost like ghost towns uh, in America now. Their 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 livelihoods have just been trounced. And and if they complain, if they complain about this, if they complain about globalism, if they complain about mass immigration, if they complain or state that they want to maintain their culture and their identity, and if they express their love of country and any sort of, of traditional values, um, the BBC loathes them. And that's who elected Trump. So they are angry about this and they are determined to put Trump voters back in their place, uh, which is, I don't know, serving their tea or something. I, I don't know. I, I know they, they, uh, they think that working class people should bow down to them, shine their shoes or something. I'm not sure. Uh, but they are furious. And they were furious at Brexit as well, because they, and you could see afterwards, that should everyone be allowed to vote? Should we have this democracy thing? Emily Maitlis again, Emily Maitlis again. I remember her describing the problem of democracy. Never underestimate the impact of sheer undiluted snobbery in all of this. Never underestimate it. So the BBC has campaigned to bring down Donald Trump for quite some time. So just let me read you just a few paragraphs uh, from this one. And it's, it's a section entitled The BBC Anti-Trump Hate Campaign. BBC antipathy towards Donald Trump runs deep. So when it came to joining in with the various schemes and plots of the Democrat-directed US media-enacted get Trump plan, the British state broadcaster was naturally more than happy to play its part. In fact, it couldn't wait to join the throng. Donald Trump is the antithesis of everything BBC. Firstly, the US president is a straight white Christian male, <gasps> heaven forbid, a demographic much reviled by Britain's state broadcaster and multicultural cheerleader. Moreover, he's rich and having passed his 70th birthday, belongs in one of the broadcaster's most reviled categories, the aged, an old, white, rich male. This fact alone is more than enough to damn the businessman in the eyes of the BBC. Donald Trump does not tick any BBC diversity boxes. Had he stuck to appearing on The Apprentice and kept his nose out of politics, the broadcaster might have tolerated him. A straight talker, the billionaire, would, would no doubt have something to say about political correctness, the Marxist creed that factory activists swear by. 
Furthermore, the property mogul is not just rich, but happens to be fabulously wealthy. Now in BBC land, money is worshipped for its own sake as much if not more than within the walls of Trump Tower. Witness those huge BBC salaries, the perks and the mouth-watering pensions and payoffs. Factory personnel simply adore the good things in life. BBC executives live like kings. But there's a difference. In fake news land, you can pretend that money is just a little bit vulgar, beneath your dignity. You certainly don't shout about it. In the world of the faux socialist, money is never spoken about in the public sphere, but it is to be enjoyed in private, away from prying eyes. By all means, enrich yourself, but for heaven's sake, do it quietly. Well, this is quite a, a, a pertinent point as well, isn't it? The, the champagne socialists, the lefties who are fairly well off, who live in fairly well-to-do areas of London and drink in expensive bars in, in well-to-do areas in London. And yet, they're all about labour and they're all labour voters and they're all about the working class. And they think, they see uh, working class people as so far beneath them as to be almost pitied and you know bless them we we must do something for them there there are sub now we can't give them any power don't get this, don't get me wrong this is not inconsistent with what i said about snobbery in fact it's a kind of snobbery this champagne socialism i'm ri i'm well off i will in i intend to stay well off uh, but i you know the little people underneath me we mustn't give them any power don't get me wrong uh, but we must do little things for them to improve their lives a bit you know you know let's let's they, 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 there's they're beneath us let's face it this is the attitude um and they uh, uh, and they, they 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 call themselves socialists but actually they are elitists uh, which is more actually in in more in line with with fascism than socialism but anyway they are elitists they believe they ought to be obeyed they believe they are the only ones who should have power and they look down on the little people uh, beneath them that is who they are and this is what we we know as the, the the champagne socialists they're rich but they keep their riches to themselves so he goes on besides the man is unrefined coarse yet enjoys the kind of life that ought to be reserved for the right thinker the inner party member this is so powerful this this little chapter this is it's almost when i read this i thought this this is it. This is what I keep thinking. He's just articulated this brilliantly, the, the snobbery aspect. And this is the reason why I picked this out. He is uh, unrefined, coarse, yet enjoys the kind of life that ought to be reserved for the right thinker. The inner party member is a reference to uh, Orwell's 1984. That such a stupid, repugnant individual can enjoy a jet-set lifestyle gnaws away at the soul of a particular type of metro liberal whose natural superiority finds itself grossly affronted. How on earth can Donald Trump be a billionaire? How did he manage to become the most powerful man in the world? How, how, how? It's not fair. We are smarter than him. The liberal order has been usurped, badly and inexplicably. It wants redress, revenge. But all of this is secondary to the real source of BBC antipathy. Donald Trump represents a real threat to its agenda, the march towards a new world order. Flaunting patriotism in the face of a globalist-run mainstream media determined to erase Western Euro-American identity has not gone down too well at Broadcasting House. Stars and Stripes, yuck. And what of the commitment to ensure the safety of American families via a functioning, fit-for-purpose immigration system? in direct contravention of the BBC's mass migration mantra. In a nutshell, Donald Trump refuses to say and do what the fake news factory demands. He also refuses to say it in the flowery way expected. It really is that simple. This realisation that the presidents will not dance to the globalist BBC tune seems to have driven an already antagonistic broadcaster even crazier as the US commander-in-chief scorned a whole house of elite instigated narratives from climate change through to mass migration, open borders and anti-Israeli sentiment. Unshakable articles of dogmatic belief within the BBC cult. Hell, the president even had the temerity to lend his support to Brexit. 
how the broadcaster yearned for the days of the previous White House incumbent, Barack Obama, a president fully in tune with the BBC agenda. How it loved those sugary speeches replete with platitudes written by a team of slick professional speechwriters. Trump, meanwhile, speaks the language of the people, blunt and undeniably lacking in finesse. Cliché. Cliché or sincerity, take your pick. For its part, the BBC prefers the latter. I'm going to leave that there, but please do re do read this book. It is, is, is a fantastic read. And parts of it are amusing, uh, um, as you can see. But it's it's really very, very serious. And the the media are at the heart of what is going wrong in our societies at the moment. They are... We're living in a post-truth era. The media have cr created a post-truth era where even our politicians, who, who uh, minus Donald Trump, the whole Western world's politicians, are doing what Sedgwick just described, dancing to the tune of the mainstream media, including, very much including Boris Johnson, as we are finding out. They are dancing to that tune and they're speaking in the way that the main mainstream media demands that they speak. Donald Trump did not do that. And that's why he's the president. That's why they voted for him. And that's why he's going to win uh, a landslide election again. I want to see this kind of spirit revived in Britain, where we can elect people who will stand up to the mainstream press. It is absolutely vital. And as you know, or should know by now, for Britain and myself, have every intention of standing up to the mainstream press. And indeed, our manifesto has policies in it that oblige the press to give a right of reply to those they smear. One would think, I think a lot of people probably even assume that you do have a right of reply when newspapers write about you, that they are obliged to give you a, a time to respond. It doesn't happen. Several articles have been written about me with no contact at all and no ability to respond or reply. That must be imposed upon the mainstream press. Let's not ask them nicely to do it. It has to be imposed upon them. And if you think that's an illiberal act, perhaps it is. But the as I've uh, explained in the past, there's a complexity. Uh, it's the... Uh, the it's, the, the uh, it, it's a complexity of 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 liberty is that sometimes in order to protect liberty overall you may have to make acts which are counterintuitive or uh mildly illiberal so uh yes we we will have to force them to expand their articles to uh allow for a right of reply it is regulation of the press which is usually not consistent with democracy however the only time i would agree to regulate the press is for the expansion of free speech not the reduction and this will expand this will make free speech greater not to reduce it because the reader will not only get one bias side of the argument they will also hear from the person in question. So if it's a political candidate and the newspaper has decided to demonise this candidate, they must give a allow a significant, not a, a line here or two, a fairly significant response from the person. So that way the reader, the, the democratic process is enhanced because the reader is getting not to read just one spinny bit of bias, it's getting to hear from the candidate themselves. And then they will make up their mind based on both sides of the argument and not just a despicably ought to be criminal um, smear campaign by newspapers. This is an enhancement and not a, a reduction in our democratic process and that's the only uh, way I would suggest that the press needs to be regulated. Okay, thank you for joining me guys this evening. Like I say, I will go through this book in as much detail in the next couple of days, probably over the weekend. Uh, and and uh, publish it as soon as I can, and we'll do this a little bit more often because I like this, and I've been reading a lot a lot of books lately, and some of which uh, I'd like to share with you. So, in summary, then to finish, just to give you another quick quick look, the Fa Fake News Factory. It's a 2020 publication by David Sedgwick. He has written other books about the BBC uh, as well. Right, thank you guys for joining me. I shall see you back on my live stream live, obviously on Monday evening. 
Well, I'm going to, uh, assuming nothing major happens between now and then, I do want to talk to you, and it's a little bit in keeping with the book that I'm going to review over the weekend, I do want to talk about America. And we didn't talk about America the last time I'd scheduled it because of the Black Lives Matter scandals. But I do want to talk about America and, and I, want to, uh, I want to get this debate going in the party because it's such a crucial one. Uh, okay, okay, I'm on, uh, I'm on parler. I'm going to assume this is the French for to speak parler. Uh, uh, and I will, I haven't checked it out much yet, but I will do so um, this afternoon. So if you're not already following me on there, uh, I'm loath to go back on social media. I really, really am. But unfortunately, it's crucial. So um, I've got to put my personal feelings aside and do my job, frankly. So I shall see you on there, uh, on Parley, Parler, uh, however it's pronounced, a bit later. And uh, live stream Monday. Um, I shall see you then. Okay, I think that's it, <laughs> that's it for me. See you soon. Take care and thanks for joining me.